The title of my message today is A Hard War, No Sissies Need Apply. A Hard War, No Sissies Need Apply. Would you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, please, if you would? Unusual passage to go to if you're talking about a hard war, no sissies need apply. Matthew chapter 6, very famous portion of scripture. Let's see if I can get there. Let's begin verse 24. Well, DJ, we read this in our responsive reading, so thank you, DJ. No man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. It's an old English word. Does anybody know what mammon is? Money. That's, yeah, it's like lucre, yeah, money. Therefore, but for most people, money is their God. My, uh, somebody, I've been quoting a lot my dad lately. Some of you old-timers would appreciate that. So let me quote him again. Uh, Dad used to say, you touch a man's pocketbook, you touch the, here it is, where's my pocketbook? You touch a man's pocketbook, you touch the dearest thing to his heart. Okay? That's why God says, you know, that's why the love of money is the root of all evil. All right. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. Don't have any anxiety for your life. What you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Now I want you guys here at the Church of Kui, and those listening that are, that are preppers, survivalists, and I have a message called Survivalism of Biblical Consideration. So, and that message looks at many of the verses of, that is, are we called to prepare for hard times. So, you, so in, in order to make Scripture dovetail with Scripture, be thinking about how, what is this saying to you and I today, who would be called preppers? All right. So therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, food, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Somebody give me biblically an animal that does gather and sow and 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 and, and put in for harvest, and like the Bible Ants. tells us, huh? Ants. Okay, yeah. Squirrels. All right. Squirrels. So so we have the illustration that we're to be like the ant, according to the Book of Proverbs, who doesn't have a leader or overseer. The Bible says, but yet they put away. And of course, in Aesop's fable, we have the the grasshopper and the ant, and the grasshopper's fiddling. All summer long, the ants are putting away for winter. Of course, he's freezing to death when snow comes. And the ants let him in, right? You might remember that famous little fable, okay? Aesop's fables are actually quite good. A lot of, they teach a lot of biblical truths in them. Not all, but uh, they, most of them do. So, we have here the illustra an illustration. An illustration is, is just that. An illustration can break down if it's taken beyond its intended meaning. So, there's nothing... So our Lord's illustration here is perfectly fine, perfectly good. Look at the fowls. They don't sow. They don't gather into barns. Yet the Heavenly Father takes care of them. But we can also look at the ants and see how they do gather into barns and how the Lord takes care of them, all right? So then he says, but which of you... Oh, by the way, let me just... If you don't have verse... 20, does anybody have verse 26 underlined with a mark with a mark on their margin? Something, what does it say on the side of verse 26? Anti-environmental. Yeah. All right. Good. 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 So you guys, you may want to take your 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 marker. If you don't have a Bible, you can mark in. Throw that one out. Get another Bible. All right. Put a line under. Are are you not are you not much better than they? Are you not more better than the sparrows and the fowls of the earth? This goes against environmental extremism. You see? You understand that? Jesus is saying a man or a woman is worth more than a kangaroo rat down on the outside of Bakersfield that that oriental man ran over with his tractor and you know, got thrown into jail and the, you know, all of the legal might of the EPA and all that kind of stuff came against him. So what you have in that, just that little clause is, are you much better than they? Yes, I am. 
-hmm. Yes, you are. You have eternal work. Jesus Christ came and died on Calvary's cross. His blood was shed for you and for me, not for the kangaroo rat. Right. right. Yeah, so it's very important. Just a little, just a little bit. That's a freebie in the message today. Okay. <laughs> Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? By the way, that's why I like Bibles with big margins. I've just about worn this Bible out. The pages are beginning to fall out. So the new Bible that's going to replace it, the margins are bigger so I can write more on the margins, okay? Don't want to forget something like that. That little phrase is very important to go against environmental extremism. All right. Which of you taking, verse 27, which of you taking thought can add one cubit to a stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Another illustration. Consider the lilies of the field, how beautiful they are, how they grow. They toil not, neither, neither do they spin. They just simply grow. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Quoting my father once again, Ray, Dad used to say, there's more revelation of bladed grass to, conv to convince an atheist of the veracity of Jesus Christ and God the Creator. Right? Just, in the, just in the blade of grass, there's enough revelation. Put it under the microscope, study it, examine it, test it, and you'll see that there's a Creator. Okay, So, so he's saying, Solomon, the greatest king probably that ever lived, the most power and might, and all that kind of good stuff. And his kingdom was so vast that you know uh, the Queen of Sheba came to see and visit this greatness and all this palace and all its opulence and everything. But he said, but the lily is even arrayed greater. You have to study it, think about it, meditate on it. Verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, those that are not in covenant with God. They're seeking those kinds of things, but you that are in covenant have a different relationship. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Praise the Lord. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. That evil there, in this particular case, is evil as in problems. Not sin per se, you know, but if, if uh, you know, we say evil befell them, some calamity. That's, that's, that's what it's talking about there, not sin in that, in that context. All right. Now, how does this apply to prepping? Taking no thought, looking at the birds and God takes care of them. So that as, as a person who believes that the Word of God is our rule for faith and practice, we must make Scripture dovetail with Scripture. We take the words of Jesus here, not fretting, not worrying, not caring. We take all the other verses that deal with preparing, how Joseph, you know, helps, you know, uh, stored up for seven years of famine with the seven years of plenty. And we put those things together and we understand other verses where, you know, you know, Paul says, you know, you know trust in the Lord with all your heart. All, all the various verses that are out there, we put them together and then we have an understanding of what God would call us to do. So in verse 33, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God. That is the gospel of Christ and his authority on the earth. And we, we want to seek the, the kingdom and the king and dumb. King is king. You know what that means. But dumb, you may not know. D-O-M, not D-U-M-B. D-O-M, yeah, is dominion, reign, rule, and might. Okay? So Jesus is the king, and he has the reigning authority, rule, and might. So we seek his kingdom, we seek him and his rule, reign, and might in the earth today and want to see it followed out and exonerated and applied. So let me ask you then, with the thought of kingdom or Christendom, I talked about Webster's 1828 dictionary of Christendom, those areas inhabited by Christians where his rule and reign are playing out in society. Do we seek first the kingdom in your life? It's a question. It's a challenge. Do you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, your re right relationship to it? Yeah. For most Christians, especially in the 20, 20 and 21st century, 
The order is something along the line of, well, first I'm going to choose a location to live. I have a ski boat, let's say, so I'm going to choose where I live. I'm going to choose by a lake because I got a, I love the water skiing. There's nothing wrong with water skiing. Well, I'm going to choose the mountains because I'm an avid alpine skier. Or I'm a cross-country skier, so I'm going to choose where I can live where there's snow in the wintertime. Not in this area. So for many Christians, that's, uh, uh -huh, this is where I want to live, this is where I'm going to live. Maybe they choose because of their job. Their job transfers them. Maybe they've been living in California their whole life, but uh, they're working for DuPont, and DuPont is back in, where is it, Vermont or somewhere back there. they got to go back to headquarters because they get a big promotion, so they go back, even though they don't want to live in all that snow and ice and everything. Sometimes people choose because of their spouse's desire, be with the relatives, and we understand certain things here. But let me, let me just challenge you that our relationship with other believers is usually the last choice. And if you choose to relate and be with other believers as your first choice, rather than job, your personal desires, you're considered to be a cultist. <laughs> See? Chuck Baldwin moved, Pastor Chuck Baldwin, moved from Pensacola, Florida to Kalispell, Montana. All that way from the sunny, sunny shores of, uh, of Pensacola to the cold weather of California. Frozen plains. And people have followed him to do so. But their order, when they do that, their order should be, and it's probably in the right order. You see that? It's not sunny, sunny Florida first. It's not my comforts first. It's what does the kingdom of God ask me to do? Now, God doesn't ask everyone to move to Kalispell, Montana. I understand that. He hasn't asked me to move there. All right? But the principle is the same. So, as I'm trying to, as we're making Scripture dovetail with Scripture, when you are seeking kingdom work, you're going to allow God to care for you. You're not going to be anxious. Uh, since I have a store, a surplus and survival store, as you folks know here, those that are watching by internet may not be aware, we have a surplus and survival store. As we talk about prepping, as we talk about putting things away, as we talk about stockpiling certain items, I always let people know that I've never lost a moment's sleep over not having something. Or I've never lost a moment's sleep of what if there's anthrax in the airports? Or a moment's sleep of what if the New World Order does this or does that? I don't take any thought for that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm on a mission. I have what I'm doing. And I do not live in anxiety or fear. So in verse 34... He says, take no thought. Now, watch this. When you are a soldier, now think of uh, this, the armies that you are aware of. When you are a soldier, your needs are taken care of so you can focus on your duty. The grunt on the front line doesn't have to worry about where the beans are coming from. He knows there's guys up the chain of command that that's their job is to try and get beans, all right? Get beans into their stomach for the sake of illustration. So as we understand then, as we put this together, Matthew chapter 6 is telling us if you're a soldier seeking first the kingdom of God, looking to see his rule and reign extended in the earth, you know that God will take care of your needs. But a soldier also comes to the field of battle prepared. He has certain things that he carries. He has his weapon of choice or he has a signed weapon. DJ and I and, uh, met, talked with a gentleman this past week. That was a saw gunner. Just got out of the service. He was a saw gunner. That is, saw squad automatic weapon. That's what he. That's what he was assigned. That was what he did in the service. So we have our assignments, but we but we are expected to bring those things and those accoutrements. Bart likes that word, I believe, doesn't he? He's, he he pronounces it differently. Accoutrements. Accoutrements. Yeah, yeah. Accoutrements. He likes those things because those are the things that you put on a soldier puts on. Now, open your Bibles to First Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 18. So, what I'm... Well, we'll let you go there, and then I'll make my point. 1 Timothy 1 and 18. So, how does Matthew 6 play out for the soldier of Jesus Christ? Let me give another example. I'm trying to, to bring this home to you. So we're not worried. And that is, there should be no place where Jesus Christ might call you or call me that we cannot go or that we won't go 
because it's not easy or because it's too cold. I've never lived in uh, Alaska. I've never lived in Minnesota. But if God called me to Minnesota, I believe I could live there. All right. I can believe I can live in Wisconsin or North Dakota. If God called me to do that, He will equip me and He will thicken my blood so that I'll stay a little bit warmer. All right? But we have to see, that's, that's the Matthew 6. I'm working in the kingdom, and if my general, my commander, my, my captain, as Hebrew says, Jesus Christ, your captain needs to be my captain. The captain says, you're going to Bismarck, North Dakota. I'm going to Bismarck, North Dakota, and I'm not going to fret about what I need to have, and you know, will I make it? Will my body withstand the icy temperatures, or whatever? You understand that? That's what he's talking about. There. The soldier does not fear that because the commander who's telling them to go to Bismarck, North Dakota, for the sake of illustration, also knows that in Bismarck, North Dakota, he is going to need Mickey Mouse boots. Everybody seen the Mickey Mouse boots, the big old heavy rubber thing, big giant thing? He's going to need mittens, and on and on and on and on. Okay. First Timothy chapter one. And uh, verse 18, if you would, please. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare. This word charge is a military term. Interesting how Jesus and Paul were very, for those that are non-resistant, you know, I'm talking about the New Testament doesn't teach any of this kind of stuff. They were very familiar with military terminology and utilized them in their illustrations and their preaching and teaching. So he says, this charge I commit unto thee, that is, I give you a command. It's a mandate, military mandate, military command. All right? So I command you, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee. That's an interesting thought here, this prophecy. That is, Timothy had a spiritual and physical heritage in his calling. If you look at uh, uh, 2 Timothy, where Paul says, you need to stir up the gift that was in you, and that gift was in your mother and your grandmother, Eunice and Lois. And he says, there was an anointing on your grandmother, a Holy Ghost anointing of Almighty God. It was on your grandmother. That same Holy Ghost anointing, that mantle, if you would, for, for those that you like those kind of terminology, I'm going to get a little Pentecostal here for a minute. That mantle was, that was on the grandmother is now on the mother. And he says, now that mantle of the Holy Ghost is passed on to you, Timothy, and you need to use that mantle that is on you that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind, he told Timothy, and stir up the gift that is in you and use it for the kingdom of God. Exercise it in the kingdom of God. All right? So that's an interesting term there. He says, those prophecies, people saw Timothy. Anybody ever prophesy over you? Anybody have to raise your hand if somebody's prophesied over you? One, two, all right, three, four. All right, not, not a lot. But I've had people prophesy over me. They come up to me and maybe they saw me as a child and, and prophesied certain things about my life. That's what was going on. That's what's going on here. All right. According to the prophecies which went before thee, thou mightest war a good warfare. Christianity is a warfare. It is a just war we engage in against sin and Satan. Just war. Not all wars are just. We have all kinds of debates go on about what is a just war. There are those, I'm not going to teach, there is historically and biblically these, those elements that make up a just war if we're talking about in the natural. But the, the warfare that we're fighting right now in the kingdom of God is a just war. May I even say to you, it is a holy war. All right? Patrick Henry, the holy cause of liberty. George Washington called liberty the sacred fire. All right? So we're in very much, in, in, and these two can go hand in hand. You might have a physical war and a spiritual war going on at the same time. Because a, a physical war will be spiritual. Either it will be according to the kingdom of God or it will be according to the kingdom of Satan. So we war a good warfare. Christianity is a warfare. I always pause here and think about warring a good warfare. Fight a good fight. Paul told Timothy at the end of his life, we'll quote that when we close, I fought a good fight. I thought about, I think about Ted Kennedy. His life was fought to allow a woman to kill a baby in a womb. His life he's known for, a, uh, because he was a Chappaquiddick, yeah, he got drunk and ran off the bridge there and, and you know, and killed this young lady. Some of you remember, I forget her name right now. She, she, she drowned in the car because he was drunker than a skunk. He got out. 
because the Kennedy family is so powerful, they bought, they bought, they bought him out. They bought him out, and he becomes a, you know, the lion of the U.S. Senate. He was known as. He stopped Robert Bork, a Christian, from getting put on the Supreme Court. See, this is his battle. This is the warfare that Teddy Kennedy fight. You know, to get the book Teddy Bear. If you ever, and that goes way, way back. It's some of the old timers of the Patriot movement. Donald Ray goes that far back. Teddy Bear. All right, but anyway, B A R E in this case, revealing what kind of a man this guy really was. So the point is, you can fight good battles, and you can fight very... Did you have something, Mike? Yeah, I was going to comment that Ted Kennedy thought he was being a good Christian, a good Catholic by by his liberal policies. I don't know how he did, because even, you know, uh, cardinals and bishops kind of wrestled with their religion to offer him communion. You might recall that. So I guess he somehow in his warped mind, maybe he thought he was, but that certainly is not the stand of the Roman Catholic Church. And I'm not a big fan, as you know, of the Roman Catholic Church, yeah. but I appreciate yeah. them and their stand for life. You know, we join with them and their many of those priests in their unqualifying battle on the front lines for the life of the unborn. Thank God for those that have that 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 spirit within them that, that God is using in that regard. So it's we are in a just war that we engage in against sin and Satan. Oh, turn over to Second Timothy chapter two, if you would please, and let's look at verse three. I'm just kind of looking at this militant imagery in the kingdom of God. So Paul tells Timothy, Thou therefore, Yeah, okay, right. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth. There's a key verse to understand what's going on here. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he be pleased him who have chosen him to be a soldier. Now, at first blush, we talk a lot about the doctrine of first blush. The doc excuse me, I just got this little flying guy. <laughs> All right. The doctrine of first blush would look like, well, man, no man wore that war that tangles themselves with affairs of this life. Maybe I shouldn't go out and get a job. Maybe I should be a mendicant monk. Maybe I should go to India and just sit on a little mat and meditate on my navel and maybe people can throw me a little a ruble now and then or a piece of bread or something like that and maybe that's what I'm supposed to do in the kingdom of God but the, the text says entangleth himself and the example of Paul Paul had a profession besides being a preacher what was that? Tent he was a tent maker Yeah. so he, when he needed some money he'd go to making tents so it's the entangling bit so that I am so entangled in my job if God calls me to, for the sake of all our illustration, Bismarck, North Dakota, I can't go because I've got so many entangling alliances I'm so entangled. Enti See, we have to be able, that's Matthew chapter 6, take no thought for tomorrow. God's called you somewhere, okay, we'll pack up and go by faith. Like Abraham went to a place he knew not whether he was going to go, but he simply obeyed. That's, a, that's Matthew 6, understanding, folks about taking no thought, considering the lilies of the field, okay? Because God has called you. So, no man that worth entangleth himself, there's a context to that. We fight under Christ's banner, in His cause. For many people, the Christ banner is the uplifted cross. That would be the banner. Because every army has a banner. They have a flag, and they rally to that flag. Uh, the psalmist says in the book of Psalms, in the name of the Lord will we set up our banners in His name. By the way, at the time of the American Revolution, there were banners flying, and people would fly banners like House of Hanover, House of Kent, you know, from the, those that are on the, uh, on the Tory side, or fighting for the House of Hanover, or whatever. Christians said, oh, look at all this imagery and all this battle on the helmets and stuff that they were wearing. So they start throwing up, you know, uh, uh, some banners of their own, in, in, you know, in, in trusting in Jesus, our hope is in Jehovah, things like that. And they began to set up their own banners. All right, so, so we fight under Christ's banner, that is the cross, in his cause and against his enemies because according to Hebrews 2.18, he is the captain of our salvation. So he's the one who gives us the orders. So then he tells this young soldier here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, this young soldier happens to be a preacher as well, thou therefore endure hardness. Folks, I'm not at liberty to contraband my captain's orders 
because I have been assigned to a hard or difficult theater of battle. Let me read that to you again. I am not at liberty to contraband my captain's orders because I have been assigned a hard or difficult theater of battle. During the Vietnam conflict, for a sake of illustration, during the Vietnam conflict, some were assigned to jungle warfare. Might have had their leg blown off by a tripwire. They would have got out of service for many years. Wheelchair bound, one leg missing, tripwire. Vietnam in the jungles. But others were assigned radio duty in Hawaii or Alaska. That would be the commander's choice. They're still a soldier. They're still going to be the best radio operator possible because that's what they've been assigned. It's the task that their captain or their general or colonel or whoever assigned to them and to be a good soldier. If he says you've got to go to Alaska instead of the, front in the jungles of Vietnam, you go because you're a soldier. So if God calls us to something, we've got to go. We've got to do. Verse 4, he says, Endure, uh, uh, Harness is a good soldier of Jesus Christ that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We already looked at he doesn't entangle himself. That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. God chooses soldiers in the battlefield for righteousness. George S. Patton. Do you know who that guy is? Yeah. <laughs> That's a hero of Ed. That's why we made a little joke here. George Patton said, all this, now listen to what he says here. All this talk about super weapons and push button warfare is a pile of junk. Man is the only war machine. Always remember that man is the only machine that can win the war. Now he's speaking purely physical military context. It's nice to have good equipment, but man is the key. Remember the French Revolution. That battle was won with broomsticks and stones by a bunch of angry women. Get a determined bunch of men and women, and they will win the battles no matter what the odds or what kind of equipment they use. We are not to fear. I used to have a battle with a, with a brother in this church back in the 90s. And, uh, you know, after, uh, let's see, time has gone on like crazy. This would be after Ruby Ridge after Waco and stuff, and he'd say, you, you know, we talk about resistance in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He'd say, they can listen in through the walls. Well, I guess they can, right? Yeah, I guess they want to. They can listen in, all right? They can do all, they can, you know, they, they're infrared technology, they'll find you in the woods. But wasn't it interesting that that police officer down in uh, L.A. a few months back, how many weeks did it take them? They had every resource available, all the highest technology, and uh, it's always not so easy after all. So the point is, he would argue with me, oh, they, they've got everything, you've got nothing. I've still got my heart, and you can't measure a heart, and you can't measure, well, like Dad used to say, I'm doing it three times, that's all right, because it's good stuff. It's true. It's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the si size of the fight in the dog. you get an illustration of that. It's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of a fight in the dog. Yeah. I mean, how many people saw the video that came out last week about the cat attacking a dog? Yeah. Yeah. Attacking yeah. The, little boy. Yeah. the cat was defending the boy. Attacking yeah, the dog. That's, a, that's the principle. We, I, I, used to, I went to Woodlake High School, which is just down in the valley here, as you know. And uh, Woodlake High School, they had an unusual coach for football. We couldn't compete with the big schools in basketball and baseball, they would usually overcome us. But Woodlake High School had to fight in the in the non-league games. They had to, we went against much schools much much bigger than us. A lot of the Woodlake High School uh, folks were Hispanic, and Hispanics in those years. Now we get some big ones are coming up now. Those years they were tend to be on the smaller side. But yet, why is it that Woodlake was always most always in the playoffs? Why were they always, you know, they were always a contender, and then they would go to the playoffs, and then they would actually battle against schools maybe almost twice their size? Because this particular coach could put within them the heart of battle, even for small guys. And you guys, anybody that's played sports, know 
If you're my size, and I was actually not this size, I'm not a big man, but I was not this size in high school, I was even smaller. And I'm having to play as a lineman, you know, or a center, or a defensive end, or a defensive, you know. We were out, we were just out pounded. I mean, we were just small. They were just so much bigger than us. But it was the fight that he instilled within those football players, all right? So we are called, and that's what, yeah, that's what Patton is saying here, invest in human beings because of the fight that is within them. They will win the battles no matter what the odds, or what kind of equipment they use, generally speaking, because if they're determined enough. And then he went on to say, the soldier is the army, no army is better than its soldiers. Okay, so that's, technology is fine, I love technology, we will use it anytime we can, but we need to understand it's the, the fight of the dog. What is that, what is it? The fight in the dog. Fight, fight of the dog. Size of the fight in the dog. Size of the fight in the dog, yeah. All right. Okay, we have to please him who has chosen us to be a soldier. My daughter and I were, and for those that on the internet, my daughter's an adult, married. And we were talking recently, and she said, she asked me, she says, Dad, why don't you and Mom move away where you would have an easier life? We were dealing with some of the issues that we, were, we faced. Why don't you move away? And I said, because I have my orders. Yeah. Yes, I would. I'd be perfectly honest with you. Especially after things that have tried expired just recently. I'd move away in a heartbeat, but I've got orders. Now, a man who really made some inroads in the kingdom of God, let me read you what he ha had to do. This is from a neat little devotional book, The One Year Christian History. Uh, and the title of this, it's, it's a devotional book. It's like your daily bread. This is the same thing, a little devotional for each day. Uh, this is, was April 22nd, and the title of it is, He Went Where He Didn't Want to Go. He went where he didn't want to go. In 1536, John Calvin no longer felt safe in his native France because he was with the religious persecution. So he left for Strasbourg, a free city situated between France and Germany that had declared itself Protestant. On his way, there he stopped for the night in Geneva, Switzerland. Two months earlier, Geneva had given its allegiance to Protestantism as a result of the labors of William Farrell, who had been ministering there for three years. That evening, Farrell met Calvin and immediately asked him to join in leading the church in Geneva. Calvin declined, saying he wanted to go to Strasbourg to study and write. Farrell thundered at him that unless Calvin joined him in Geneva, God would bring down curses upon him. I don't know whether he would or not, but it convinced Calvin. Somewhat intimidated by Farrell's pronouncement, 28-year-old Calvin agreed to stay, even though his preference was to go to Strasbourg. Calvin's initial stay in Geneva, however, was short. God was calling him, but it really wasn't a bed of roses, as you'll see. In January 1537, Geneva's Council of 200 zealously enacted a series of ordinances prohibiting immoral behavior, gambling, foolish songs, and desecration of Sunday, with no thought as to how they would be enforced. A little bit of hasty there. In July, the Council ordered all citizens to assent to the Confession of Faith. In November, the Council ordered banishment for anyone who refused to swear to the Confession. This was more than the man on the street could stomach, and the city council elected election three days later, a majority of anti-clerical councilmen were elected. The new city council and Calvin and Farrell locked horns when the council ordered, and so here's the civil magistrate, here's a good example of civil disobedience. The civil magistrate ordered the two pastors to administer the Lord's Supper, communion, to everyone regardless of their spiritual condition. On Easter, while preaching in separate churches, both Calvin and Farrell announced that they would not give the Lord's Supper to such a rebellious city. Many in the audiences drew their swords. And without the aid of, you are not going to give me communion? Oh, I'll show you. Okay, so they're ready. They're so spiritual, they need communion, but at the same time, I'll kill you for not giving me communion. Many in the audiences drew their swords, and without the aid of friends, neither pastor would have made it safely home. The Council of 200 met the following day, April 22, 1538, to decide their fate. The meeting stretched into a second day, at which time the order was given to Calvin and Farrell to leave Geneva within three days. Farrell went to Notchell, and Calvin returned to his original plan and went to Strasbourg. In Strasbourg, Calvin became pastor of the Church of the Strangers, a French refugee church. There he met and married Idolette de Bure. So he gets married there in his new church, and he's banished out the widow of an Anabaptist. Calvin was content in Strasbourg and probably would have spent the rest of his life there 
Had it not been for the Roman Catholic Cardinal's efforts to bring Geneva back, and when he, when he says efforts to bring Geneva back, those are by the power of the sword, as you know, that's the way the Roman Catholic Church did in those days. To bring Geneva back into the fold of the Catholic Church. In 1539, the Cardinal wrote to the Genevans, inviting them to return to the Pope. No one in Geneva felt qualified to answer the letter, so it was sent to Calvin to respond, which he did very effectively. Meanwhile, Geneva was not doing well in his absence. A new election had placed the city government back into his hands of friends who feared that the only way to save the city from anarchy was to bring Calvin back. As a result, in 1540, the Council of 200 voted to invite him back to Geneva. So now they're going to petition him, please come back. Once again, Calvin's personal desire was not to go to Geneva. He wrote to a friend, There is no place in the world which I fear more, not because I hate it, but because I feel unequal to the difficulties that await me there. And once again, it was, it was through the counsel and persuasion of Farrell, who himself was not invited back, that Calvin was convinced to return. He returned to Geneva in 1541 and ministered there the rest of his life, making Geneva the center for the Reformed faith. All right. So why? Because he had orders. So I'd rather be in Strasbourg, I'd rather be anywhere but Geneva, but he had orders. Do you have enough faith in Jesus that if he gives you orders, you're not so entangled or so fearful about what tomorrow may bring that you can't obey the Lord? All right. Now, as we don't have too much more here. Today, Christians see their duty in God's army more like a weekender in the National Guard. After the training meeting, Sunday service, the guard has no relevance in their day-to-day -day living until the next meeting. Think about that. Christians see their duty in God's army more like a weekend during the National Guard. After the training meeting, church service, the guard has no relevance in their day-to-day -day living until the next time the guard is called up. The soldiers today in Christ's church have it backwards. They seek their own comfort first, then their military obligations last. I remember when Jill and I were up in Oregon a number of years ago, and we were living hand to mouth. We were starting a tree service up there, and we were supporting a missionary couple, and they're a lovely couple. But I remember we got this letter, and they said we're going to have to be taken off the field uh, if you if we don't increase our our uh, you know our our our, our, our uh, what do you when you give to someone and you give an offering, and unless our offerings are increased, that that you know that keeps us going on the field. There's still a word there missing. Huh? Pledges. pledges or whatever. Yeah, we need to increase our pledges to keep us in the field. And they said, and, and then they, they gave a breakdown. Well, you, we've got to have so much for for our four hundred one k. We've got to have so much for our uh, our, our, our medical. And they had this list, and it wasn't the couple; it was the organization that they belonged to was requiring them to have this and this and this. And so I looked at Jill and I said, "Man, these you know this is not the kind of missionaries that I remembered as a kid growing up when you're called to the mission field, right?" And so I said, no, well, we'll, stop. we'll find somebody else. I'm not, you know, I don't even have a 401k. I still don't have a 401k or any of that kind of stuff. I still don't have medical insurance or any of that kind of stuff. And I'm not complaining. I'm just, I'm just simply saying that missionary and pastoral things have changed from what they were a long time ago. Can you say, man, and not to the betterment, but to the worst? It's a calling. So, wait a minute. I've seen, I've seen pastors. Let me give me an example. How are we doing, Tom? All right. I remember when I, we tried to get a caretaker here. 15 years ago, I put an, an, an ad in World Magazine, which is a pretty, was, was a pretty good-sized publication. I don't support them anymore. That's another story. But anyway, World Magazine, about a caretaker position that we had some things that we could do there. Number one question, what are the medical benefits? I said, I, I had laid out, this is a church, it's a ministry, da 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 Number, What are your medical benefits? I said, we don't have any medical, medical benefits. I don't have any medical benefits. Well, I'm not coming. Are you called to a position or not? Are you a soldier of Jesus Christ or you're not? You, you understand that? Boy, it's quiet. Okay, I know. <laughs> it's an uphill battle. I'll make it. All right, but I've got to preach the word anyway. Soldiers today in Christ's church have it backwards. They seek their own comfort first, then their military obligations last. In God's army, provision follows obedience. That's your Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness in your right relationship to that kingdom. All right? Provision follows obedience. The old saying that most of you, if you're in the church a long time, we're, right, we're raised with, I'll put it right here, where God guides, 
He provides. Mark that down in the fly leaf of your Bible. Where God guides, He provides. So provision follows obedience. The soldier takes the field knowing that headquarters has already considered the contingencies, the what-ifs, etc. So he takes the field wherever God's called him to do in war because he knows that headquarters has already knows that he needs bullets and beans. Let me give you a quote from America's Christian Heritage. It's a book written by Gary DeMar. And this is why separatists left Holland before they came to Plymouth, Massachusetts. It says, in addition, so remember the, the separatists, they left Scrooby, England because of the persecution. Then they went to Holland where there wasn't persecution, where they could live their life pretty freely. And then they ended up leaving Holland and then coming to America, and then we have the story of Plymouth Plantation and all those good things. But when they, before they left uh, Holland, before they came to Plymouth, Massachusetts, he says, quote, in addition, they wanted to live in a society that was thoroughly founded on the Bible. Not simply a place where they would have freedom to go to the church of their choice. Let me read that to you again. In addition, they wanted to live in a society that was thoroughly founded on the Bible. Not simply a place where they would have freedom to go to church, the church of their choice. In Holland, they had the freedom. No problem. Nobody bothered them. Nobody persecuted them for beating in the church there in Holland. They wanted a society that would leaven their children's hearts for righteousness and justice and truth. So they ended up making an arduous journey all right, to Plymouth. The separatists took serious their tour of duty. Using a little term they were familiar with. The separatists took their serious their tour of duty, realizing they were engaged in battle full time, not just on Sundays. You see that? So we can meet on Sundays in Holland, no problem, but the battle is engaging us more than just on Sunday. So let's close. And did I, uh, open your Bibles, if you would please, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. You may still may be there. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we'll begin reading in verse 6. This is the close of uh, Paul's life. You know, he, Nero's going to have his head in a few days. And he says this, I have fought a good fight. Remember that, folks. Some fights are not worth fighting. They're not a good fight. But there are good fights. They're fights that we must fight. They're holy fights. They're righteous fights. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Remember, I gave the illustration. Some guys in Vietnam were called the jungle battle, where they might lose a leg or lose their life. Other soldiers were called to be a radio man in Anchorage, Alaska, and there wasn't too much action happening. But... If they were faithful, if they were a good radio man, right? God will reward them, and their generals would reward them. And in this good fight, and Paul's fight was very, 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 as you know, difficult fight. He was beaten with rods, stoned, all kinds of things happened to him. He says, in all this, in my course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Praise God which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love His appearing. Praise the Lord. I trust that you are looking forward to the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ today. He's a righteous judge. Not only would He give the Apostle Paul a crown, but He'll give you a crown of life too if you stay faithful to Jesus. Father, we thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the soldiers of the cross. I thank you, Lord, for the army of Jesus Christ today. Thank you for the soldiers that are represented here, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage us. Help us not to be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. Bless this, your people. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.